from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to the Cube's Cube Conversation here in Palo Alto, California. The Cube Studios, I'm Sean Furrier, host of the Cube. We're here with Reinhard Quella, who's the principal engineer, cloud platforms and solutions group at Cisco. Reinhard, well, thanks for coming in, good to oh, see you. Thanks for having me. So, technical conversation around cloud is something that we love having. We've seen the evolution over the past decade, cloud 1.0, compute, storage, greenfield, cloud opportunities, great SaaS applications being built. You've built um, apps for over a decade, SaaS apps. That's right, been delivering uh, applications both to data centers and then of course later into cloud for a number of years. Um, so you got some scar tissue, you had some successes, you've had some struggles probably with you know, on-prem, but the world's changed a lot. And again, we've, gonna be, we've been covering this for a couple of years now. We saw public cloud, all the benefits, no questions. Great, you can lift and shift stuff up there, no problem. But the complexities are still there. And now the trend is everything's shifting back to on-prem with cloud, so now the hybrid model has been validated. Amazon Outpost, Anthos from Google, Azure Stack from Microsoft. Clearly this, all the cloud vendors are telegraphing, they are doing it. This is a reality, this has been validated. Yeah, I think that's no surprise to those of us who've been deploying for, for a number of years. We, we've we always had data centers, where we're running our applications with data centers, but, but uh, and yes, we started taking advantage of the cloud, but there was always components of our infrastructure that continue to run on-prem, um, whether for historical reasons, for uh, data gravity reasons, policy reasons, any number of reasons. Um, but what we did learn was was how to operate our applications differently. And so we, for the last number of years, we've been moving a lot of the advantages of that cloud back to, back to on-prem. So I want to get your thoughts as a um, principal engineer and look at the overall Cisco holistic uh, portfolio of products because now, Cisco is a standard in the enterprise. Every big company has Cisco gear at some level form of another. Mm -hmm. um, you've been dealing with networking for years, but now that networking becomes so much more acute um, issue because you still got to move packets around. Another abstraction layer does networking, security, networking, all tie into the growth area that is now this next generation of cloud, cloud 2.0, intelligent edge, data center on-prem. What's the Cisco story? Why Cisco? Why now? What's the story? Well, the amusing thing, of course, is the cloud doesn't exist without networking. Um, the very first thing when you set up an Amazon, you know, a, a compute in Amazon, is you set up a virtual private network and you start deploying into that network. So, so it's always been true that networking is at the core of cloud. And so um, the complexity of, that we're seeing over time is, is that the workloads are everywhere. The workloads aren't just in my data center and I'm not paying attention to data center networking or just cloud networking, it's connecting them together, securing them, making sure that they're, they're fast and well managed. And so, so it's always been true that networking's at the core of this and, and as the edges get blurry, as we move workloads from one place to the other, um, all of the things that Cisco does around managed networks, programmable networks, secure networks, all um, become even more important. And everything's amplified too in terms of its purpose. You're seeing automation is a big trend that's impacting uh, the infrastructure and app developers. Uh, you've deployed SaaS apps within Cisco for over a decade. You've seen your share of, of successes uh, and is issues. But now as the, the data becomes critical, you got security perimeter issues are gone. You got surface area with industrial and IOT. It's only getting more complex. So the complexity never went but it's still complex, either the same problems. What's, what's changed, what's, the, what's going on? Well, so one of the things that's changed is that we've, we've and this is something we can credit, credit the cloud providers for doing, is we, we've learned to treat our infrastructure in a different way. I mean, the way we deploy and manage everything, including networks, compute, even applications, um, operating in the cloud demanded that we automate those things, that it demanded, um, the way you know when you're when you're managing now fleets of 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 thousands or tens of thousands of machines at scale in the cloud, um, and when your cloud provider won't promise you that any machine won't go away at any moment, you get good at replacing machines. And now we take those same tools, concepts, ways of operating that we did in the cloud, and we apply them on prem. And so a big part of what Cisco has been doing across our entire portfolio is ensuring that every piece of it from networking to storage security is programmable and drivable through automation. You and I were talking before we came on camera and I uh, wrote this down. Um, the phrase you like to use is uh, referring to Cisco, why Cisco is, we bring cloud innovation on prem. 
Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, really, it's 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 taking these new ways of doing things, these new opportunities. Um, you know, when we talk about, we've had some funny com conversations with our security guys, for example, where where historically in security we would we would have some policy, we would deploy applications against that policy. Once every six months or twelve months, we would audit against that. Well, one example of bringing the cloud innovation on prem is is the way you deploy that software is or deploy a, a new policy is via software. And so auditing that is checking your code before you commit it that says this is what it's going to do. Running reporting on the things that you've deployed so that you can see. So it's taking these advantages of, of automation and observability and, and um, things like code review that are just normal practice in software development and apply them to infrastructure. And so again, what Cisco is, is doing is making sure that all of our infrastructure can be can be programmed in that way, providing tools that allow us to program the, the, the uh, things like the network services orchestrator or, or cloud center suite that allow us to deploy applications or networks or whatever else as software entities. Talk about the reality of the person who's been um, innovating in the cloud and their reaction when they come back on prem, they go, okay, I've been doing this in the cloud, and then I turn around and I see yeah, all this. Yeah. Is this the cloud innovation dynamic that you're referring to? Is it, is it the realization that I had some innovation in the cloud, agility, automation, and then trying to figure it out or applying it or both? What's the reality when someone goes, wow, I'm on prem now, what's that innovation layer? Well, there's, there, there's several realities, uh, depending on, on who you are and where you're coming from. And one of my first my first roles at Cisco was, was I was working on the WebEx operations team and, and that, you know, the way we ran that operations was typical of the time it was built. Um, and we did an acquisition to a company, um, from, of a company that had been operating in, in Amazon. Um, and when they saw the way that we had to deploy and manage their application on infrastructure, they were horrified. It's like, what, what do you mean I can't deploy a server in five minutes. <laughs> what do you mean that I can't manage the workflow in this way? And so for them, it was a, a shock and horror that they didn't have this infrastructure. And that's when we deployed our first our first private cloud in, in, in WebEx was to support that style of deployment. Um, the flip side of that is the, is the people who are operating those existing data centers with those existing workflows, their world changed. I mean, they had to learn new ways of doing things. They had to learn new ways of, of managing um, their infrastructure. Um, coding skills were a requirement, not something that a few guys did scripting in the back. Um, so it's like, there was a lot of change to the people and to the, to the way we did things. But really it's a matter of bringing those, you know, bringing the cloud, bringing software development to operations, bringing software programmable to hard, programmably to hardware. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, we cover that a lot in theCUBE, but I think one of the things you pointed out is the realization that, okay, great, new way of doing things, innovation, but as you kind of, pointed out, there's a double-edged sword there. The command and control of the network, which has been an old style tactic, which doesn't go away, you still need to have control of certain things. And on-premise, you, you certainly can control it on-premise. On cloud, you can think you control it through software, but this is the, the, the deep dive tech conversation I want to have with you, because we're talking about app deployment, Kubernetes management, and the reality of, I have my own gear on site, as well as I'm maybe serverless into the cloud. This is the new reality that you have to manage the control. So take us through the, those layers, app deployment, Kubernetes, and the reality of managing infrastructure on the future basis. Sure, so um, it's, uh, when, when we think about the application deployment, it's, just, you know, it's very easy to kind of think about it in terms of the layers and the, and the programmable layers that you provide. And, and I'll, I'll just touch, we won't go into detail on the products, but, but ultimately today for an application, uh, someone deploying an application, increasingly that means push an application into Kubernetes. In other words, I'm going to I'm going to package my application as a container. I'm going to hand it to a, to Kubernetes through Kubernetes API and I'm going to expect Kubernetes to do the deployment and manage that. Okay, so that just makes a problem for the guy one layer below you. Where does Kubernetes come from? It's like who deploys and manages Kubernetes. And so there's a number of different solutions in the public cloud you can use, you know, um, you know, AKS or or uh, the um, uh, uh, Google's Kubernetes service or Amazon's, any of these. Uh, but on-prem, where does it come from? Who's going to manage it for you? Who's going to create that? And so uh, Cisco's uh, Cisco Container Platform is a product to deploy and manage Kubernetes to, to offload that from the from the developer, I mean from the operations guy or the platform manager. Um, 
Of course, that deployer of Kubernetes expects programmable infrastructure. I need to be able to deploy a VM or manage hardware that runs below that. Back so, to your innovation message. Yeah, it's like. I, the innovation they want. I, they, they need, well, ultimately, the guy wants the simple push the button and get the application deployed. That means someone has to get this layer deployed. And well, to get that layer deployed, what's there? And so we, we, we continue to support virtualization uh, managers, whether VMware or our, our own CVIM, uh, Cisco Virtual Infrastructure Manager. Um, all of these products to say, how do I manage this pool of hardware to provide that next layer of service? And so, um, but in every case, the, the 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 programmability of the infrastructure, as far down as you can go, becomes paramount. So that you know, when the guy racks a piece of hardware in the in the data center, he doesn't want to think about how's this RAID card need to get configured, right? He just wants to rack it, plug it in, and and then turn it over to software as quickly as possible. And that's the cloud innovation on-prem you were referring to. That's making it cloud-like operations for agility, automation, uh, provisioning. Consistency, reliability, observability. Yeah. Give you an example of that. I mean, when we, when we were talking originally when we were starting these cloud deployments and we had this conversation with InfoSec about, about you know, which, which application lives in which zone and how do you manage that? And we're like, well, you know, the zoning processes that you used in the past don't apply anymore. The way, the way we manage that thing is with security groups and, and the security groups are created this way. Here's the software, here's the software that the, the, the and when I'm talking software, I'm talking about configuration scripts in this case, uh, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, whatever, um, that generate those security groups and generate those rules. And it's like, it changes the way the security guy interacts with your team. It's no longer file a ticket to review your app and app deployment and have a new ticket to do a deployment. It's something that they can do in real time. We talk about moving moving these processes left, you know, moving the moving the audit of a system all the way back up to the software development stage and then giving them the tools to verify that afterwards. And their eyes literally popped open. It's like, you mean at any moment, at any time, I can say, you know, show groups and see what the security posture is right now, and it's like, yes. <laughs> and that's what sold them on letting us behave in this new way, was the ability to audit in real time. For yeah, and this is a major advantage. This brings up the question uh, that comes up all the time, and I want to get your thoughts on this, because this shapes into the overall cloud architecture, cloud portfolio, in this case for Cisco products, is workload portability. Um, it used to be, oh, the one-way trip to the cloud, not anymore, it's not a one-way trip to the cloud, it's now bi-directionally got on-premise, been validated by Outpost, Anthos, and Azure Stack. Mm -hmm. This is going to be an operating model to your point about the cloud innovation. Now workload portability. I think that's been validated, so I think we recognize, the industry recognizes that it's not just public cloud everywhere, it's hybrid. This has yeah. been validated, you agree? Absolutely, we, we, there, were, there were many things that we never did move to the cloud, never would move to the cloud, um, whether, it's, whether it's for policy reasons or the quantity of data that we had or systems that weren't available in the cloud. For example, dev test labs that have soundproof rooms. We, we, we sell audio equipment. We sell phones and we have to test those phones. Those aren't ever going to be in the cloud. They're going to be, they're going to be in their soundproof rooms so we can test audio pairing. There, there's stuff like that that always lives in our world. There's there's a myriad of of of, uh, of compliance also requires it compliance too. Compliance things, uh, the you know whether it's a FedRAMP compliance, this data has to be in this country, well U.S. in that case, uh, European privacy things. Um, it could be. Um, I was talking to one bank um, a number of years ago now that we're, we're, we're deploying, we're talking about deploying Kubernetes for them. It's like, what applications are you deploying? Why do they need to be here? Well, they're building, a, they've got a mobile first application. They want to use all the latest and greatest ways to build and deploy that application. But the data that that application is accessing is in the mainframe. It hasn't moved in 10 years. 20 years, it's not going to move anytime soon. <laughs> and so, so, so you put the application next to the data that it needs. In IoT, it might be um, control devices or video devices or any number of things. It's like, I think there's a trend overall. It's less about workload portability for a lot of people or being able to move workloads. It's saying, where's the best place for this particular workload to run? And so then provide the appropriate infrastructure to run that workload. And that's where we get back to saying, wait, wait a minute, I want to use containerization, I want to use orchestration systems, I want to use all these modern tools for doing this, but still put the workload where it needs to be. That is a profound statement. I just want to just quickly um, unpack that a little bit because that really is the heart of the issue of cloud innovation. The workloads are going to be defining the requirements it needs, whether it's cloud selection or where it resides on-prem with what resources underneath it. That's not saying a company has to decide that because of that workload, 
the entire company has to use that. Because the choices now, because of the levels of granularity that cloud brings, the applications can get almost custom built or, or not custom built, but you know, specific well, custom, they are, they are, they hardware are. and compute to serve their needs. So if it's a, uh, you're sole sourcing a set of resources for the workload. Yeah, but that's not saying that the infrastructure has to be that for everything. This is the whole single cloud versus multi-cloud dynamic. Yeah, I mean, in fact, one of the things that we're seeing more and more in our in the uh, in our customers is is like they don't have one cloud. They have multiple clouds for multiple purposes. On-prem, there's not one big private cloud that runs everything. There's lots of Kubernetes clusters. And one of the things that a product like CCP does is allow you to deploy and manage multiple Kubernetes clusters for multiple purposes, multiple problem domains, multiple political domains, financial domains. Who's paying for this thing? Well, it's easy if you just buy the servers that are appropriate to your department and you run it. You still get to take advantage of all the, you know, the way you deploy and package and run these applications, which is just hands down better than we ever did before. And that's some of the innovation we have. Now, once you start doing this, once you start deploying these applications in multiple places, in multiple, well, where are your security borders? Where are your perimeters? How do yeah. you secure any of this? How do you connect all this stuff? How do you, how do you visualize all this stuff? And so, as you look at our products from, from, you know, we talked a little bit about the infrastructure pieces of that, you know, the Kubernetes deploying to an infrastructure manager, deploying ultimately to hardware, every layer of that, you know, UCS and CVIM and CCP, all of those layers are there and, and programmable. Okay, now I'm deploying workloads. Now I've got to connect the things yeah. together. How do I monitor it? How do I, how do I, and so that's why you see products like StealthWatch Cloud and AppD and yeah. um, the other applications to do monitoring and security across a now fully distributed application. You know, sometimes it's hard for me as a Cube host to um, kind of get the story out about certain trends, especially when um, big players like Cisco are involved. A lot of people know that I'm pretty bullish on Cisco. I've been very vocal about the Cisco opportunity with respect to cloud, and critical, by the way, in some areas. I think I, I would probably advise certain things to be certain ways, but one of the things I think is a great opportunity that you guys have, and you're kind of getting at, I want to just get your reaction and thoughts on this is that what you're talking about here is an environment that's going to be constantly dynamic, mm -hmm. that's constantly changing, and being complex is not going away, abstracting away the complexity is the game. But Cisco's always been successful in multi-environments, multi, uh, different environments, because networking has always been about diversity of networks. Campus, this, and SD-WAN. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a new concept for Cisco to deal with this concept of multiple environments. Yeah. You're, do you agree with that? And what's your reaction to that? How would you answer that? Uh, is, that, is, that a, is that something that you think Cisco's yeah. going to be dominating in? Is that the reason why Cisco is, can solve up all these, serve up all these choices? What's it's, your thoughts on I, that? I, I, I would have to say that overall, that the, the integrating lots of disparate things, connecting lots of disparate things is in Cisco's DNA. I mean, from our original routers and switches at the very beginning, it was always, multiple things connected to each other, often multi-vendor, um, working across standards and across standard things. When we talk about Kubernetes, we're not talking about the Cisco Kubernetes, we're talking about Kubernetes, like the real thing, the actual Kubernetes. We're talking about, and we're talking about Steven, we're talking about OpenStack, a standard. We're talking about, uh, so across all these boards, connecting and integrating disparate things is kind of what Cisco does. Um, and so if you're deploying applications, you've done that, and certainly your customers are, they're never going to have one general purpose situation. It's going to be, um, scenarios, right? And, and certain things will, will be guiding principles, some will be governors and, and dictate things that might not be classic cloud native. Can you talk about that and give some examples of why that's important and the reality of that statement? Yeah, so uh, just to use one example of an application, uh, WebEx Teams, um, the, um, our, our enterprise chat application, for example, that, that is your classic microservices, modern cloud native application. Um, there are three ways of deploying applications in that platform that are appropriate for the three different things. We've got the, the services themselves, the, the, you know, the media bridges or the switching engines that are run as containers in a container orchestration fabric. There's the VM-based things that are things like, uh, like media bridges that don't run in containers very well, not because of the problem with the containers, but because of the overlay networks that containers bring with it and the way you route data to those. And then we've got physical machines um, where we're actually running certain things on physical machines. And so all of these exist in any kind of, even a brand new modern application. And so 
even within a single product family, there's not one true way of doing things. So it's what's the appropriate way to deploy this application? What's the right deployment target for this thing? And then how do I connect these? You mentioned together? InfoSec, so politics might be a driver that have nothing to do with technology. It could be a human capital resource issue. It could be something I, I, scalable. I mean, and, and the politics are even, or can be even these weird temporal things. It's like, look, I can spend, I can spend, you know, three weeks trying to convince an InfoSec to do things in a particular way, or I can just deploy somewhere where it makes him happy and move on, <laughs> move on to the next problem. And then later when they catch up with, with the way we're doing things, then we might, may move it later. Um, the other thing about timing on all this is the story is changing constantly. Uh, when we deployed that application, we did not use Docker containers. Everybody says, why aren't you using Docker? Because Docker didn't exist three years ago. <laughs> it's like the decisions we were making at that time um, are, are changing ever and more, more rapidly. And the reality for our enterprise customers is that you don't just forklift one and replace it with another one. You, yeah. you, you tend to manage them all in parallel. Even as you're making transitions, you know, eventually you kind of get rid of the old stuff, maybe, the mainframe still exists. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but in general, it's for most of our enterprise customers, it's not an or, it's not on-prem or the cloud, it's not containers or physical machines, it's it's and, I'm, I'm running all of the above. And to your point about the Docker containers not being around when you guys were doing that, that's going to be a concept that's going to be applied down the road. Hey, that wasn't around when we set the architecture. So as an enterprise, your customers that you talk to, what is the guiding principles? What's the preferred architecture? Again, a lot of choices. You guys are trying to make your, your, your your portfolio fit the bill. What are some of the decisions they have to make to, so, to future-proof? Because they don't want to foreclose an opportunity and, and or create technical debt for that matter. Why would they do that? So they have to kind of be holistic in their thinking. Yeah, future-proof future, future -proof is always a, is a funny concept because, uh, because the reality is that the, the, the way you do things will change. Um, you didn't make something that was future-proof. You, built an environment that allowed you to do this way and that way. <laughs> so if you take a look at, uh, at the, the way we deployed, for example, our infrastructure in general, we, we, you know, we start with the UCS substrate, we can run Oracle on bare metal on those things when we need to, we can run virtualization on top of that and run a layer of VMs on top of that, we can run containers. Now I've got choices common substrate, common way of managing those things, but at least three different ways of deploying on those. And so ultimately we're looking for, for standards, standard practices that enables me to have, to do the and, where I can run things side by side, I can connect things, I can secure things over the top, but run all of the above. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a matter of building things that have kind of clean architectural layers where one thing consumes the other, and then be able to mix and match and plug them together, Lego style as it were. This is a great chat, and it reminds me of a conversation we've been having here in theCUBE. We've been doing a series with uh, engineering leaders, and you know you mentioned uh, foreclo um, foreclosing the future or, or future-proofing, which is kind of a buzzword. The conversation happening in the technical circles is about technical debt. And I think, you know, I've always seen that enterprise, uh, you know, cost of ownership, you know, mm -hmm. on the shark fin, the iceberg, and what you don't see. Certainly that's been a paradigm that's been, you know, known. But now you're getting into this notion of not just so much future-proofing, it's really the balance of technical debt because you know something new is coming. This is a, a modern concept that takes cost of ownership and future-proofing and kind of puts it into reality because you're essentially taking on some sort of technical debt to move from point A to point B, but you don't want to take on too much that <laughs> you can't pay it back yeah. if new technology comes in. So this is what's been going on in some of the you know, top uh, customers that we've been talking to. And a new, a new management concept, this is kind of a, a modern new management discipline. Your thoughts and reactions to that? Ooh, so there's at least two different vectors to talk about on this. So, so one of the things is how do I take um, these older applications, these older ways of managing things and incrementally improve them? Because we can actually make it, e it is easier today to deploy a process running on a machine than it ever was before. And it, Five years ago, I would have a ticket, some guy would go and install software manually. Today, we don't do that. We use 
configuration management, Puppet Chef, Ansible, et cetera. We improve the way I do those things incrementally rather than just forklift them. I'm not rewriting these applications and saying, okay, we're going to make these into cloud native applications and microservices and blah, 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 and re-platform them. No, I'm, I incrementally improve the way I operate that thing. Even if it's just deploying the hardware more consistently underneath or improving this layer. And so I incrementally reduce my debt by applying, again, deploying some of these new cloud, cloud innovations. They're grown out of the cloud um, to the existing ways of doing things. Um, but the other point I'll make on a lot of this is that certainly for our team and for a lot of the customers I talk about, um, we don't just arbitrarily go and replatform things, right? It's like, it's like if the thing is working, let it continue to work. Deploy the new thing alongside it. You know, we're, we're more concerned about delivering new features, new capabilities, yeah. new things. Um, and we do that and we concentrate our efforts and our engineering efforts on that and not constantly rewriting the past. And containers certainly can help you there too. Uh, Absolutely, That's where containers, Contain shine. containers are a beautiful tool for that, for, for encapsulating dependencies around a thing. And so you'll find in many cases, um, we have applications that are not ready to deploy, to, to run in, in Kubernetes with, uh, with a scheduler that's going to move it around, but I can still take advantage of the container packaging and run it on a physical box with a normal Linux operating system and containerize there, and so it's, uh, it's, it's usually valuable. Right, I want to get your thoughts on one last talking track on, um, that is relevant to something that we've been covering. Stu Miniman, co-host of theCUBE with me on many of these events uh, around networking. We both love networking, both networking nerds. I always joke about how networking is where you go to find out what the state of the industry is. Look at what's going on in the network. Because the network is ultimately does, tells the truth. You're moving things around, security people go to the network. You're starting to see all this, everything's revolving around the network now, more than ever. I mean, still, it's been that way forever. But you, you, you just made a comment before we went on camera. You said, just adding another layer of networking. If you think about what you just said, the networking paradigm is just kind of slowly moving to another layer. So networking, is happening, it's just happening differently. So as the DevOps innovation in the cloud happens, it's really a network innovation because security pivots off the network data, use application instrumentations on the network data, everything's around networks. It, it's intrinsically tied. I mean, in, in the past we had you know, a, a machine, a physical machine had a, a network interface singular <laughs> and and it would, you know, and, and a, a network identity, right, an address, um, VMs multiple network interfaces, multiple on every VM. Kubernetes, an IP address per application, right? It's like the, the, the networking space is exploding as we move up and, 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 and yes, we, we now have a network connectivity and management problem that's order of magnitude more complicated than it was before because now individual workloads have IP addresses. And, and by the way, I'm deploying workloads in multiples. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't run a single application, I run a pool of applications, each one has an address. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so networking is, is continues to be intrinsic and it just moves up. And it's fascinating too, you know, we always speculate about looking for that new technology, the new protocol, something new, the shiny new toy. But if you think about it, all the science and intellectual property has been built already. It's usually a combination of a couple different things um, in network theory and network management. The concepts are still around, they're just being applied differently now. This seems to be the- Yeah, the, the grand, or, or sliced into smaller, you know, smaller, the bytes are smaller that you're, <laughs> that you're dealing with, right? We're, we're, everything has an IP address. We've got thousands of IP addresses now that we're managing. We have an IP ad address management problem. We have a, you yeah. know, a, other, other things to manage now, but it's- uh, The game but, is still but, the yeah, same. The game is still the same. It's still TCPIP networking. So final question, bottom line, why Cisco in the cloud networking as it comes together? Is it, as this stuff starts to modernize, hybrid certainly reality, um, hardcore as people are doing today, multi-cloud is another reality right around the corner. Why Cisco, why Cisco's products and portfolios for the, for the cloud? Well, fundamentally, um, as we said earlier, the, the cloud is a networking problem. Um, networking underpins everything we do. Um, the networking, from physical networking, the compute has to run on something. The, the, so networking, compute, orchestration systems for all of that, um, security that overlays all of that. I think Cisco uniquely has all of the components that it takes to build a modern infrastructure stack and in fact deploy applications to that. And I think the breadth of knowledge and capabilities that Cisco has across those is, is, is um, unique. Um, and then also I would say Cisco's experience. Um, we have many, you know, several of the world's largest SaaS applications in the Cisco family. 
um, things like umbrella, DNS security, or WebEx, web conferencing. Uh, we also have deep expertise in running applications, and so and that's within within the Cisco you know area of or domain of expertise. Certainly in good position. I'm really bullish on what you guys can do. I think the network is where the trust is, that's where the data is, that's where the action is. And I think that's the cloud 2.0 equation. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Thanks for John. the insight. Reinhard Quella, principal engineer, cloud platforms with Cisco here, sharing his insight on this CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. <laughs>